picture this. You're standing in the middle of the store talking to a robot, <laughs> going, I need this. And the thing's looking at you, and who knows what it's doing, right? right? And you feel stupid. I said, you know what? Use your phone. <laughs> I'm Adam Bulka, and this is The Great Supply Chain Podcast. I'll be talking to supply chain experts from around the world, experts who are tackling challenges in their corner of the industry. People are change makers that drive innovation. That's why this supply chain podcast is about learning from those who lead by example. I hope that the conversations you hear will inspire you to drive change within your organization. Let's jump in. Welcome back to the Great Supply Chain Podcast. We're at Modex with our first ever on-location interview. It's pretty loud here on the floor at Atlanta's Georgia World Congress Center, so uh, we hope our new fancy tech drowns out enough of the background noise in this first of our episodes on the go. And based on the flurry of tech on display here today, we have a perfectly fitting show for you. We're unraveling a topic that is top of mind around the world for people both inside and outside of supply chain, robots. But more specifically, we want to get into the pragmatics of those robotics in different areas of the fulfillment cycle. Guy Corte and I are speaking with Jim Brownell, partner in the Go5 consulting practice for robotics firm Grey Orange. We'll be touching on the shift from early adopters to mainstream robotics, some emerging use cases like customer robot interactions and some of the unintended inefficiencies that automation and robotics could introduce so without further ado over to you Guy. thanks adam and thank you everybody for joining us today on our next episode of the great supply chain podcast i'm sitting here today with jim brownell Jim, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. And Jim is from Gray Orange. So Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit, tell our audience a little bit, who are you, what do you do, and quickly, what is Gray Orange? Okay, so name is Jim Brunel. I'm uh, in the industry for over 35 years, primarily on the customer side of the house and most recently on the, the vendor side of the house. And for, the, for my job, a part of a Gray Orange partner in Go5, which is a strategic consulting arm of the, of the organization. We handle the... Uh, more strategic customer, more larger customers in the Gray Orange portfolio today. You know, we we represent everything that Gray Orange carries and our, everything that Gray Orange provides for our customer. You know, so Gray Orange is, is uh, started out life about ten years ago mm-hmm. uh, as primarily a hardware robotics company. Okay. Uh, the two founders decided at that point that there was a space for. They had been in robotics in their college years and they had won numerous co- uh, robotic competitions with more traditional kind of robots, uh, you know, robot competitions. And, um, uh, you know, they wanted to take that and parlay that into kind of the next business venture. And they came up with retail as a place to put um, to put the robots. So uh, they started that process. And then through the years, as they implemented solutions, customers, as always, kept asking for more and more functionality. Of course, pesky yeah. customers. Yeah, exactly. Which really helped shape the company in terms of you know, functionality that was delivered at a software level that the robots could take advantage of. So during that time, they also expanded the, the portfolio of robots in terms of providing different feature functions uh, more specific in a facility. But they also had the same time develop uh, additional software functionality to support the robots. But more importantly, they had to develop functionality to support a, a warehouse. Hmm. And whether it had a warehouse management system running in it or where, whether it had an, an old warehouse management system running in it and how to, how to not let that get in the way of an automation implementation. Hmm. Okay. Um, so Because that's always a very challenging project for most companies to entertain. Absolutely. So, so let's talk about automation. Let's talk about robots. Right. So, Jim, what you're seeing in the market today, obviously, you know, we're seeing automation robots. It's, it's, it's top of the fold. Right? Everybody wants to talk about it. But when you're out there talking to customers and prospects, and when you guys are looking at the space in general, you know what what twenty thousand foot level? What are you seeing in the space? Is it as hot as we think it is? What what are you seeing the adoption rate looks like? Why are people asking for robots? You know, should we care? So absolutely, you know, and the nice thing about it now, we actually have the early adopters that we can look at from lessons learned. So they've done things, and some of them have been very aggressive, and some of them have been not so. Uh, and when I say it that way, in terms of their level of automation, but we can actually see, we we're talking to a customer today, and they have a very, um, 
a complex implementation of automation. And when you ask the question, how's it going? It was actually a kind of a pregnant pause. <laughs> And you're like, well, wait a minute, you guys spent a lot of money. And, and oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're getting the benefit we expected. But clearly what was not said was, yeah, and it caused some other issues for us as well, you know, things that we may not have looked at. And so now they're kind of cleaning up around their automation. They don't want to get rid of it, but they need to clean it up, uh, both the, whether it's bringing product to it, whether it's taking trash away, even to something as simple as that. Um, but they're looking at it from both sides to try to figure out a way to make it more of a positive or a, an, an, a creative, an additional creative process for them. So we're seeing across the board people bringing kind of more of the mundane side of robotics uh, to the table, and that's existing users as well as even new users. You know, we chatted a little bit earlier about, you know, you and I did about, uh, you know, paving the cow path, and a number of companies, you know, their, their foray into automation is to say, well, let's just replace this person with a robot, mm. right, and let's, let's save that money. And, and they do it. You know, the original push was, was efficiency, you know, units per hour, units per person type thing. So it wasn't really to replace people, but it was really to make them go faster. Right. Right. And so the goods to person phenomena was just that, so that people weren't walking to their product, but the product was actually driving to them. Um, and so it saved time and made it much more efficient. They still had to pick it. They still had right. to put it in the tin. They still had to do the things they do, um, but it made the process of just that, that initial presentation much faster. And then the other thing that we're seeing, which is, you know, pervasive in the industry today with where we're coming out of the pandemic is, you know, just the concern over the workforce and the mm. stability of the workforce. Uh, and it's not not anything that they're that they're, um, you know, concerned with workforce in terms of people doing work. It just is not enough of them to right. do the work. And then, you know, as they get into peak seasons and other times, finding the people at the right times. And of course, that drives not just availability, but it drives cost. You said something, Jim, which I want to latch on to and talk about, which I think is really interesting, is you talked about asking some of your customers, you said, yeah, it's great, but it's created some unintended consequences. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's fascinating that, that, you know, there's, in every investment we make, we, sh we know this, right? I think you and I are old enough to have been through enough of these. We try to solve a problem, and sometimes what, we solve that problem, but we uncover other inefficiencies or maybe other problems or maybe other secondary issues that all of a sudden now we say, oh goodness, like we did this right, but because we didn't think of it in the system, we've created unintended consequences. Right. Can you talk a little about that? Because I think it's really a fascinating aspect that we don't really spend enough time on, which is, oh, I put automation in, but then it created this issue over here. Right. So primarily as I see that, it's it's really optimizing a certain part of that process. And again, as you said, not, not understanding or or fully um, understanding the impact of that that solution as it as it goes into the environment. So we th see things as you know they put in the automation and then there's a bottleneck on the conveyor. The raceway isn't fast enough. It can't hold enough it can't hold enough totes. Right. Right. And and that becomes a huge problem because in some cases they don't have the room to now and the technology is not there to speed that process up. Right. So it now becomes a huge bottleneck. So you find people that. Um, uh, tend to make up the, make up excuses for the automation, right? And so there's an example in the industry that I use. They were one of the first ones to put a nice uh, tilt tray sorter in for mm -hmm. shoe distribution. Well, when you really watch their, their practice, they use the sorter twice a week only. Um, and in order to do that, they had to batch orders up to a certain size. And it would take them four hours to stage the product <laughs> and to run it through the conveyor, the, the sortation system, and they would get great productivity out of that. And then it would take them six hours to put all the residual cartons away. Uh, right. Right. But yeah, but the automation did exactly what it was what supposed, it was supposed to, to do. Right. And we're seeing things as difficult as that, but even, like I said, more mundane as, you know, it's starving for totes. They can't get totes to the front end fast enough. Right. Right. Or the, the back end is, as they're consuming totes, they can't get them away fast from enough. fast enough. Right. And in some cases, even more mundane, just the trash. As they're doing, they're inducting, they're creating all this trash. And, they have to have people and forklifts sitting there waiting to pull trash away, which costs them a lot of money and takes a lot of time. So, you know, so we see a cross like said, from the mundane piece to something even more strategic. You know, the other interesting part on the strategic side that you'll see is you lose sight of an order. Mm. So when you order, every order isn't this nice, perfect little piece. It's It could be a fast mover, it could be a slow mover, or it could be both in the same box. And when you're when you're putting in automation, you tend to look at the productivity of a SKU, right. not of an order. Right. So, you know, again, there's a customer we're talking to, their potential customer we're talking to today, they put in a great gleaming cube to do a lot of the perfect work, but yet sitting next to it was a three-tier manual pick mod 
that was three times the size and held 80% of their SKUs right. uh, sitting right next to it, that now they, they, they process through everything through the automation and then, and then for a number of set, set of orders, they had to wait right. right, for the other side to catch up or they would ship it twice. Right. Right. They'd ship out one box and just say, okay, we're going to ship out two boxes and now incur that expense. Right. 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 So, so people who are ahead of the automation curve, kind of the conversation now is, hey, how do we get the rest of it to catch up? So let me ask you this. Do you see it as the market needs to maybe, and maybe you're going to tell me, stop saying that, Guy, because I want to sell robots. But <laughs> do you think the market at some level has to sort of pump the brakes a bit and start looking instead of individual workflows where automation is going to help, but really take a step back? and look at the overall automation strategy for the business, and then under, identify which ones make the most sense, but understand the repercussions they might have. So I'll give you an example. You know, I was talking to Dwight Clappett from Gartner this week, and he was talking to me a lot about that, right? Where he, he is talking to his customers saying, hey, you gotta look at the overall picture first, right? I mean, this is strategy 101, right? Take the big picture where you wanna go first and then boil it down. Do you feel like we've, we've We've missed or we've, we've forgotten that muscle when it comes to automation. We sort of see the, for lack of a better term, the shiny object of, well, this robot does this, let's do it. And to your point, all the examples you gave were fantastic. Like, oh, I didn't think about the fact I don't have totes right. or I'm going to have a bottleneck. So, do you, are you seeing that? Is there a shift we're seeing in the market? Should some of our customers sort of pump the brakes a bit and say, yes, automation is coming, but take, really think about how it's going to impact your business? Yeah, the challenge is, um, and the answer is yes. But a qualified yes. Uh, the, the 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 challenge is is that 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 is a long long pole on the tent, right? Because you can you can take that to an I wouldn't say an extreme, but you can take it to its its end, which is I have to go all the way back to the factory and have them right. relabel, right? right? Have them retake it or have them do these type of things, and 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 getting that change to happen is a 18 month right process, right? And then I have all these other things to work through and I have a WMS to install and so on and so forth. So the engineers in us can over engineer that solution. Right. Right. And so you try to find uh, a way to decouple those type of things so that you can work on them, work on them either simultaneously um, or um, when you work on them back to back, they, they don't have to be coupled together. You can find a way to we'll work through that. Um, so it's a difficult challenge from that perspective, uh, you know, taking on that object, like you said, and really kind of went after it and, and really achieved some great results. And now are paying, I wouldn't say too much of a price, but they're paying for something back that they have to go back and retrofit, you know, from that perspective. Um, so it is a balance you got to find. And the challenge, the other challenge, which is you have pesky customers. Oh, yes. It's customers right. again. Right. Ah. You know, if we didn't have those guys, we could fix yeah, all well, the problems great. in the world. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So you have them driving you. Right. right, and then all your competitors, people are going out making very difficult promises to their customers, and you're looking at it going, there is no way you're going to do that. Right, but the customer doesn't know that. Right, right. We who work in the industry know there's no way you're going to do that. I was working in a furniture business, and one of the competitors said, "We will guarantee our, our mattress for the rest of your life." Right, and then the furniture business, you're like, "There's no way." <laughs> <laughs> but as you think about it, you're like, well, that guy's not going to be there for the rest of their right, life. Right, yeah, so right. he doesn't really he doesn't care. care. Yeah. yeah. He made Two years he's retired. He's made a sale. He's got his commission. He's off. Exactly. So um, so you do have the pesky customers which are driving the time equation. And that's, you know, as I talked to CEOs about the problems, I said, look, it's either faster, better, cheaper, yeah. or faster, cheaper, better. I bet in all cases, it's faster. Yeah. Right. right? You just have to pick whether you're going to do it cheaper or you're going to do it better. Right. Uh, um, but it's going to be faster. And uh, by, the, by the way, faster is by far the number one parameter that you use to do these things. So I think that's what drives a lot of these pieces. So it is up to the executive who's running that to be able to step back and, and orchestrate two or three initiatives at the same time. So when you're all said and done, they've all come together and it's now a holistic kind of solution. Okay. From that perspective. No, I, I think that's, that, I, I like that perspective. I think it makes sense because you're absolutely right too. I think one of the things that we're seeing, I think that's a, a fear is, a, you know, analysis paralysis is yes. I can look at everything because I got to control everything. And you said, maybe go all the way to the manufacturer, maybe go back to the sourcing, right? right? Hey, I want to source something this way and et cetera. Uh, and then all of a sudden the world passes you by. Right. So I think we have to balance that. So one of the things you talked about too, which I want to, I want to sort of pivot a bit. And I know based on your experience, right before this, you worked at the Gap, I believe. Uh, yeah. The years uh, ago, but I years did. Years yeah, ago. Yeah. But, but you, you, you know, you've been in the retail beast that is, that is the retail my, beast that's out career, there. Yeah. You talk about, about some of this also comes back to, you know, we sort of automate everything, but we forget that it's an order. It's a customer. Right. Right. It's, I bought something for my kid's birthday or 
uh, I bought something for my anniversary or I bought something for myself because I don't feel good and I want it, you know, a nice, nice whatever. Right. We forget that it is, there is a person behind it and it sounds corny, I know, but it's still, it's an order. It's a person behind it. Right. You know, are you seeing that we're maybe with the automation, how are we going to still keep, and things are going faster. Yeah. How are you still going to keep some of that intimacy that, let's face it, some of the retailers out there, the only time they're going to touch the customers when that order arrives at the door. And if right. the robot is picking it, or the robot, is there a fear that we might lose some intimacy or can the robot actually help us build more intimacy by freeing up FTE to do something else in the, in the warehouse? Now, I think it's a ladder, as you just said. I think, um, you know, working on a project previously um, with a specialty retailer, they found out, they actually closed their uh, e-commerce distribution center. And because they looked at the number of orders and where they were and doing the analysis, it's, you know, it only comes out to like five or six orders a store per day. Uh, and when you think about the traffic in a specialty store, it's pretty light generally on a, on a non-weekend day. Um, and the unintended consequence from that was they actually uh, saw on many occasions where their salespeople would look at an order and say, hey, this is for Guy. Okay. And they'd write on the box, say, hey, come on in and see this. Right. Right. And then somebody would get that. So it does free up the time for more of that. So they're not just doing these mundane tasks. They actually can do the value added pieces that customers would want. Right. And differentiate. You know, but that's always the challenge is kind of getting the right staff to do that. But it did allow for some of those things. And I think if you really pull it back, you can see that. And as executives that run businesses, uh, I think you're starting to see some of the people starting to understand that you still you have to get the high touch part of it back. Right. Right. Because everybody, you know, box showing up doesn't generally give you loyalty, <laughs> right. right? It's only when it doesn't show up, then it takes, it makes you disloyal, <laughs> right. From, right? Like, I'm not going to order from you anymore. And uh, so they got to find a way to keep the, the customer engaged with their brand. Right. Right. Not with the technology that allows same day delivery because everybody can do that. And why would you shop me? Right. Just right, because you, of, right. Exactly. Right. Right. So let's take it, let's, let's, let's go a little crazy here with, you know, we talked about automation. A lot of it's in the warehouse. We just start talking about retail and fulfilling orders. I love your example of, you know, that retail, you said, Hey, they're, they're going to fulfill the order from the store because that store associate knows that you said, Hey, Oh, geez, that's key. I know them. I'm going to write you a note. And I right. think that's a really great example. Are we going to start seeing automation now in the store? Are we going to see more automation? I mean, we're yeah. seeing automation in the warehouse. Do you think we're going to start seeing automation in the store? And if so, when and what's it going to look like? Yeah, you know, definitely. Um, and, um, you know, we actually were having a conversation today because, you know, there are solutions that are appearing in the stores that are much more store friendly. The biggest challenge with stores today is the wild. It's still the wild, wild west. <laughs> you can't get them to comply with most anything. Right, so the integrity, the information integrity is so bad. I mean, you, you know, people do things like, well, we're going to disable the quantity key, right? <laughs> we're going to disable, you know, the, the, the zero cost transaction where they're doing an exchange because that means, you know, who knows what they've done in terms of data integrity, right? So they go back because they can't get people to say, I'm going to scan a, a can of Coke and a can of 7-Up instead of two cans of Coke, right? right? And that type of thing and throwing integrity off. And so we're still doing those type of things at the store level. So the promise of, of what changes at the store level, you know, is a challenge. And this is one that I've had difficulty with in terms of feeling that we're going to get there is the RFID solution, right? I mean, the, the it's been around, I don't know how many years now, I, 15, 18 yeah, it feels years? Yeah, like, since like the ice, ice, ice age. That's what yeah. it feels like. And, you know, the promise still is, is getting there, but it's still not there. But in order to get better at the store, we're going to need something like that. Um, and I think there's storefronts that use that and can use that a little bit more than others. And you'll start to see those type of things come out. But when you do that, that lights up a whole bunch of capabilities. Because mm -hmm. now that I know what's in my store, right, it can do things like, you know, the fitting mirror, which used to be... Yeah, nice novelty, and people said, yeah, great. But then you still had, like, like you know, two or three mice behind running out and getting product <laughs> right, and right. all of the things. So it wasn't very productive. But in today's world now, you know, you could walk up to a mirror and it says, I want the, you say, I want the blue one. Well, an alert can go on and say, give me a blue one. Now, no, by the way, it's on that table over there, right? right. So now, and they know it's on the table over there because they just, the RFID just scanned it and said, there it was. Right. So they can go get it and they'll feel better about it. They'll say, oh, great, here's the blue one. Or it could be in the pile up at the cash wrap or it could be in the pile of the, of the back of the fitting rooms or it could be in the back of the store. But at least they have some fighting chance of finding it from that perspective. And then there's so much push in the stores today to carry more product or more selections 
um, for customers to see whether it's different colors or different sizes or different silhouettes. And so you're going to need to have that level of capability in the stores. And so, you know, I see that kind of technology coming to the stores. And the other thing is, is, you know, order fulfillment technology, not necessarily coming to all stores, but coming to stores um, in a more effective way. Uh, and, and some of that will be just systems, uh, software systems that mm-hmm. allow people to do things. And other ones will be with some level of automation, mm. you know, because the back room of the stores are probably the least automated of anywhere. Right. Uh, and, um, but that, that goes a little bit to the challenge of the store associate and being, you know, compliant because that's not what they do. They sell, they don't manage inventory. So last question, Jim, because I, I, I think you hit on something really interesting and we could do a whole other podcast on this. Do you think the adoption of automation in the store is more about the fact that store itself is not going to be compliant or use it properly? Or is it a fear of, hey, if I've got a robot operating where little Johnny's running around and we, you know, you and I know, okay, it's not really going to hit him, but little Johnny might jump on it and all of a sudden he hurts himself. And guess what? Six o'clock news. That's the lead story, right? (laughs) Yeah, robot robot attacks a kid. Yeah. Robots are here. The, our robot overlords are here. They're taking right. over the world. Look at little Johnny. Right. He hurt himself. Right. Do you think, is it one or the other, or is it a combination of two? Or where do you see that yeah. limitation is? Yeah, this is that uh, little pet peeve thing I talked about. I don't see robots on the floor. Okay. You know, somebody asked me once, an investor, and said, hey, Jim, we got this great idea. You know, we're going to put this robot in, kind of the orchard supply robot, and you go up and say, hey, where's I got this screw here. Tell me where it is. I said, guess what? He said, well, I said, nobody's going to do that. He said, why not? It's just, I said, picture this. You're standing in the middle of the store talking to a robot, <laughs> going, I need this. And the thing's looking at you and who knows what it's doing, right? Right, And you feel stupid. I said, you know what? Use your phone. <laughs> right. I said, and what, what Home Depot did, right? Take a picture of it. It says, oh, that's an aisle 15, whatever you go there and do it. I said, everybody will use their phone. So it doesn't mean you don't have robots in the back of the store, but I don't see robots much Maybe in, in, in a, in a follow-me type of situation if you're shopping or something like that just out of convenience so you're not pushing a cart around. But as far as interaction and things like that, direct interaction, I think that's going to be a much harder challenge to do. I think people would be much more comfortable. Like, i got to find Cheerios, and they put on their phone, and it says that's over one aisle. Yeah. And they go from there as opposed to robotics. But in the back, definitely the robotics to take advantage of the, the, the configuration of the back room to get more product in there. And it's not just for e-com picking, it'll be for store replenishment and service from that perspective. So I can see more automation in the back of the stores. Fantastic, I I think that's a great point. You're absolutely right. I think we, I forget sometimes. We carry a supercomputer around with us every day. If I'm Home Depot or any of these guys, why am I gonna invest in a system that I can just pull out of my pocket right. in order to do the same thing? Right. I, if I need help, I'll just ask Siri or whomever on my phone. Right. and. So I think that's a great point, and, and I think it's it's certainly interesting. I think you're 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 you you make a great analogy to, to the fact we already have this. So what? But you're right. I certainly see this too. Right? The back store is dark. It's gross, but right. it's an opportunity to do something with it, and right. then you put automation in there. Right. So that's fantastic. And it, it's probably the least um, optimized of any place that you have. Right. Right. Yeah. Jim, this has been awesome for the audience. How can people reach you? How can they find you? LinkedIn, TikTok. Twitter. Well, what's the best way to get touch? More you? traditional. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Um, and uh, I mean, if you want to send me an email, yep. it's James. B. Name is Jim, but James. B. At GrayOrange.com. Perfect. So James. B. At GrayOrange.com. Correct. Uh, find you on LinkedIn. You're not on TikTok. That's right. okay. Yeah. Neither am I. Uh, Jim, this has been really good. And again, really appreciate the time. Uh, and for everybody listening, thank you so much for listening to this episode. And look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you, Guy and Jim. Thank you for joining us today and being our first on-location podcast guest. Automation is the future, and you've just given us a glimpse of what's to come. Until next time, this has been The Great Supply Chain Podcast. Well, that's it for this episode, folks. I hope our guests sparked some new ideas and inspired you to push the boundaries of supply chain. New podcasts will be published on the first of every month. In the meantime, please reach out with your thoughts or questions or even an idea for a future episode. You can email us at texaspodcast at texas.com. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get notified as soon as a new episode goes live. And please share it with a colleague and leave a review. Until then, this has been the Great Supply Chain Podcast. I'm Adam Polka, and thank you for tuning in.